Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing.
morning, everyone. That's two weeks in a row. It's like you're all awake. Is it the time change? Is that what it is? I uh, just want to give you a heads up. We are starting finally with the uh, replacement of the carpet. That's why some of this section over here is blocked off. So just a heads up next week. Uh, if your seat is not available, I promise you that if you have to sit in a new place, it will eventually form to you as well and you'll be comfortable. All right. So don't just like walk in and get mad and walk out. Uh, it's really good. We're going to be seeing some more of the changes take place that we've been waiting on, and it's really exciting. We'll have a fresh new look uh, before Easter Sunday to welcome everybody in from the community uh, for their once-a-year visit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, why don't you stand with me this morning if you're able. Uh, my name's David. I'm going to lead you through a few songs of worship this morning as we begin. <laughs> Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Oh, why we made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
Once again, I just want to welcome you this morning. And if you're wondering where Kana, our drummer, is, she's one of the problems when you have really good musicians is they tend to get hired and go on tour with people. And she, I think, is in Gary's hometown today, actually, of Heaven, Evansville, Indiana, uh, trying to figure out what White Castle is, actually, from what I understand. <laughs> She said, should I do it? I was like, yes, you will never forget the experience. <laughs> but, you know, as we're singing songs like Build Your Kingdom here, I think, you know, there's a lot of messages that you hear in churches of, uh, I don't know, something along the lines of, like, give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be perfect. You're going to be rich. You're going to be healthy. You're gonna <laughs> and you have my permission, if anybody ever says that, to stand up and walk out because <laughs> it's 100% false teaching and they're just trying to sell you something. But... The cool thing about this, and when we pray, um, your kingdom come, your will be done, and what I like about that song is it reinforces the fact that we are the ones with the mission to change the earth, to enact God's kingdom here on earth. If we listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we do that by lifting Jesus up and living in submission to him, which is what Lent, the practice of fasting, is about, is surrendering something to him. So uh, let's be thinking about that as we sing this next song.
does you come before you this morning to submit to you, to worship you, and to lift you up as being greater than ourselves. And I pray that that would result in us surrendering our lives to you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. And this morning as we prepare to take communion, I really just want to continue in that thought of, of surrender to God. So why don't we just take a moment? Um, 
to bow our head, close our eyes, and uh, Dana will continue playing some music for us and just think, are there any areas of my life that I need to surrender to you, God, and then ask for his strength to do that. Sometimes people say they don't like to come to church because they said the music makes them cry. It made me cry today. Because sometimes music is the place where you feel God's presence the most. So come to church and cry. It's okay. I have to stand in front of all of you and I may have makeup all over and I don't care because I would rather connect to God than to not ever cry in church. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered with his friends and they were eating a meal. They didn't know what was before them that evening, but Jesus did. And as they ate, he took the bread and he lifted it up and he gave thanks to the Father and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And at the end of the meal, he took the cup And again, he gave thanks to the Father, and he said, this is the cup of my new covenant poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. If you're with us for the very first time today, we want you to join us in communion. If you're watching online for the very first time, we want you to join us from home. Grab some juice, grab some bread. This is an open table. It means all are invited if you simply want to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, pour your Holy Spirit upon these bread and this juice and make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we may be raised with him in his death and in his resurrection. That we may know you for eternity that we may have a hope of grace in our lives every day of our lives, that we will never despair because you are with us. We thank you for this gift and we ask that through it you will strengthen our hearts and our minds in our journey of faith, which often is wobbly, but by your grace it is enough. So help us to receive your grace and your strength now. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if you're in the sanctuary here, the way that we take communion is our little um, portable cups. If you didn't get one when you're coming in, they're probably in your pews in front of you. If you're sitting in that back section and you need one, you'll need to come forward. We started, um, we're going to start getting ready to move pews, and so we started cleaning out the back sections already. But you can come forward and get some. But go ahead and receive the very top layer. Pull that off. Oops, I just broke mine. All right. Lift it high when you have it. Receive now the body of Jesus Christ. Receive his grace. Receive his mercy. Receive his love. Go ahead and pull off the the lid of that little cup. Those of you at home, you're allowed to use coffee in place of it. Just any liquid, just lift it up high. The blood of Christ poured out for us for us out of his abundant love for us. Receive. Loving God, we just ask that you will help us to be the people 
you called us to be. Help us to love you with our whole heart and help our actions to follow so that we may spread the kingdom of God to all. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are continuing our Lenten journey today through the book of Matthew, and we're going to focus on a parable that Jesus shares with some religious leaders. If you've been doing the reading with us through the book of Matthew, you know those daily readings that come to your email, you probably have realized that we have already, Jesus and his disciples have entered Jerusalem. And if you've been around church your whole life, you're probably like, wait a minute, that's Palm Sunday sermon. <laughs> and you are right. The, the readings don't line up exactly. And so next week, we will focus on Palm Sunday. But just the reality is in our reading today, you need to know that Jesus is actually in Jerusalem. He has entered Jerusalem, what they call the triumphant entry. And we won't talk about that now. But the first thing he does when he enters Jerusalem is he goes to the temple. And we get to see what is probably one of the few temper tantrums of Jesus. He is mad. He goes in and he starts turning over tables and kicking out money handlers. And we always get scared and we think, oh, maybe we shouldn't sell Girl Scout cookies here because Jesus doesn't like buying and selling at church. It's not what it meant. Jesus always knew what he was doing. So during that time, in order for you to worship, you had to go to the temple in Jerusalem and you had to take your sacrifice and sacrifice it to God for atonement. Well, many people lived a long ways from the temple and they had to travel in. And so maybe they were going to go and make a, a sacrifice of a pigeon dove. And so they would, they would have to carry it for a long way. And that's not always convenient to carry a dove with you and all your other stuff. And so when they got to the temple, they could purchase a dove. The problem was the money handlers were inflating all the costs of the worship supplies. They realized they had a monopoly. People came from all over and they had to buy there. And so they were jacking up the prices of the worship supplies, of the doves, of the ox, whatever you were going to buy. They were charging ridiculous costs for it. And Jesus couldn't believe it. A place of worship, people who are just trying to be obedient to God, and people are robbing from you in your worship. And so he got a little angry, and he turned over a few tables. And after the money, the money handlers are gone, Jesus begins to do what he always does. He heals. He begins to heal people there that are sick. And this whole thing is being watched by the religious leaders. They've watched him knocking over tables, and now they've watched him healing the people. And they are observing, and they're getting really anxious. They're not happy about this. And then Jesus goes and leaves for the day, and he goes to Bethany to sleep. The next day, he comes back to the temple, and the religious leaders are ready for him. They are waiting. They've been planning. They have a question. They're going to ask him a question. They're going to trip him up, and they're going to prove he's not who, who the people are claiming he is. They're going to prove that. So they have this question. They ask him this question, and he answers them in three different parables. And today, I'm going to just tell you about one of those parables. It's the middle parable, the second one. And in order to do that, I want to give you sort of a key to the parable, because a lot of times when you're hearing ancient parables, you're like, what? And so we've got a key for you. So you'll understand as I read it who the different people represent. So here is our key. So as I read it, the land owner, the landlord, that's representing God. All right? He is the owner of the vineyard. The servants and the son who come collect the harvest, well, they're prophets of old, and the son is Jesus Christ. The tenant farmers, the people who have been hired to, to take care of the vineyard, that is the religious leaders. 
The vineyard itself represents the kingdom of God. And I'll explain a little bit more about this later on, but the kingdom of God at that point is the nation of Jerusalem. And I'll, I'll talk about that later on. And then nation, or where it says people, you'll, you'll see when you hear it, it's referring to the church, which has not yet been born. So I'm going to read this passage to you. I'm reading out of Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. These are Jesus' words. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, and he put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and put a tower. Those are all things needed for a, a vineyard. Then he rented it to the tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time for harvest, he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed his servants. They beat some of them, and some they killed. Some of them they stoned to death. Again, he sent other servants more than the first group, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him, and we'll have his inheritance. And they grabbed him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenant farmers? Jesus is asking the religious leaders. And they said, he will destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyards to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. And Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a people who produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person it falls on. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they knew Jesus was talking about them. And they were trying to arrest him, but they feared the crowds who thought he was a prophet. Okay, this is a story or a parable, should we say, about perspective. Perspective is something we all have, right? We all have a perspective on a situation, on an event. We all interpret it in our own minds what it means. And the perspective of the religious leaders is that they're trying to protect their religious faith, their traditions, all that they've ever known, how they've always done things. They're just trying to protect that. And they see Jesus as a threat, a threat to their very faith and what they believe and what they carry down for generation after generation after generation. And Jesus is telling them that the kingdom of God was entrusted to them, but they have not taken care of it, taking care of it. Very two different perspectives. Okay, there's two guys and they're sitting in a bar and they are in remote wilderness, Alaskan wilderness. And one is a religious guy and one is an atheist. And they're talking about the existence of God and they're debating and they're fighting. And it's getting quite lively because they both had four beers. And so they're going back and forth, kind of rowdy. And, and finally, the atheist said to the religious guy, hey, it's, it's not like I haven't tried. You know, I've tried to believe. You know, I've even done that prayer thing. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I got away from my camp and I was in a, in a snow blizzard. It was like 50 below. I couldn't see anything. I knew I was going to die out there. And I dropped to my knees and I, I cried out to God and I said, save me, save me or I'm going to die. And the religious guy looked at him and he said, well, then you must believe you're here. He said, no. A couple of Alaskans came along and helped me find my house. It's all perspective. How do we interpret the world around us? You see, we all do this daily, right? We're constantly interpreting, and we are constantly interpreting our view of God and how he works and what he does. When things goes well, we feel like, well, we must be good with God because everything's just kind of flowing. We're blessed. God must be happy with us. And when things go wrong, we're like, really, God? What did I do? Why are you angry at me? Why do you seem to like everybody else's kids better than my kids? We, we constantly have this changing perspective of who God is and how he works. And that's what the religious leaders were expecting. They couldn't see a truth that was 
right in front of them that God was doing a good thing. They couldn't see that. They saw it as a threat. John the Baptist and what he preached, and then Jesus Christ and what he was teaching, the miracles, it was all a threat. It wasn't good in their eyes. It wasn't the way they thought God would work. And because of that, they were in trouble now. Verse 46 says, Therefore I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and be given to a people who produce its fruit. So, as I said before, the, the kingdom of God was really the nation of Israel. They were blessed by God. They were called. They were elect people. They were chosen to be a light and salt to the world. People would be drawn to God because they would see God's love and care of this nation. And the religious leaders were to care for their nation, were to care for those people. And they had all kinds of privileges and, and, and blessing from God because of it. And now Jesus is saying, you're going to lose that. You're going to lose it because you haven't cared for the kingdom of God. You haven't been faithful to God. And they're extremely threatened by it. And the funny thing is sometimes people read that and they say, oh, well, God's going to take the, the kingdom of God from the nation of Israel and give it to the Gentiles. No, 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 no. That's not what that says. It says to people, and the word for people here is nation, and it's a reference to the church, the church that hasn't even been born yet. They don't even have a word for it yet. Another will be the church who will produce fruit. That's us who will produce fruit. I mean, this is kind of a, a huge parable. It's talking about something that's going to happen in history that's going to change everything forever. Everything's going to be changed because of what's going to happen here. And this story is an amazing story, but there's also some simple truths in this parable. Sometimes we miss even the simple stuff. And they're very hopeful, and I, I want to point those out to you because they should give us hope in our day-to-day -day life. You should have something to be hopeful for when you walk out today. Here it goes. The first thing the story tells us is that God trusts us. How do we know that? Did you catch what the landowner did? He hired the tenants, and he went away doesn't mean God goes away. It means that God trusts us with his kingdom. He entrusts us. He, he, he lets us make decisions. He allows us to make decisions in how to bless others. He empowers us. He loves us so much. He knows we're smart. He knows we're good. He knows we can do the things we know we're to do. He trusts us. It's a thing of love that he gives to us. It's like when our kids start to get older and you begin to entrust them with more and more responsibility and freedom. Well, God does it to us. He's not a taskmaster. He gives us the kingdom of God and he trusts us to expand it in our daily lives and as a church. God is also patient with us. If you look at this story, the landowner kept sending messengers and the people kept killing them. And then he sends more. The patience of God is endless. Can you see that? He's constantly forgiving us for our brokenness, for us deciding not to do the right thing. He constantly is giving us another chance. And he gives us another chance. And he gives us another chance. He's such a gracious God. Thank goodness for the endless chances he's given us in our lives. I'm so grateful because I blew so many of them when I was younger. And he's gracious. If you're not an owner of a vineyard, you wouldn't really know this, but the story is set up that the landowner sets everything up for success. The people are set for success. Before he ever um, gives the task to the, to, the, to the farmers, the vineyard's been set up. And that's what God does for us. He sets us up for success. He blesses us in ways that we, we cannot imagine and, and we have everything before us that we need in order to be successful and we just feel so blessed. He gives us privilege so that we can do the work, so that we are able to do the work of the kingdom of God. He, he takes care of us before we ever ask him to. He is so gracious to us. Got my papers out of order here. The last one is God's judgment does exist. 
This is the part we don't like. We don't like judgment. Let's just think about grace, right? But there does come a day when he takes the vineyard away from the farmers. But we need him to be just, right? Think about it. He's a just God. We need him to have an answer for evil. So yes, we need him at some point to bring justice because that is the God we serve. And for all the opportunities and all the patience and all the entrusting that the farmers are given, all the supplies, the grace and all that, sin creeps in. It always does. Sin creeps in and the farmers decide to keep the harvest. They decide they know better than the landowner. They decide they're going to do it their way, not the landowner's way. Now, there's a couple other truths in here which are kind of remarkable that have nothing to do with this sermon, but I want to share it with you because sometimes, you know, we, we miss some of the beautiful things in Scripture. This passage tells us two more things. As I said, Jesus has just landed in Jerusalem, and he knows what that means. He knows, and he starts getting really honest about things because through his ministry, he wasn't ever just saying, I am the Son of God. He didn't do that. He knew that he would have had a much shorter ministry if he did. But now he's getting more obvious about it. But he does in here because he's referring to himself and he's talking about the son of God who goes to the landowner. He's beginning to really reveal who he is and he knows that this is going to really incite the religious leaders. But did you catch the second thing? He says the son will be killed. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus walked right into Jerusalem knowing that his days were numbered, that this was going to push everybody over the top, and that he was going to be killed. There's no doubt that he didn't know that. He didn't just agree to it at the last moment. He knew what he was walking towards. He knew he was walking towards the cross. He knew the sacrifice he was going to make for all of us, and he willingly did it. So while a lot of parables have a different meanings, this parable is kind of clear. It's going to talk about a moment in history in Jesus' death that's going to change everything forever. When Jesus is going to die on the cross, grace will be released to all of us and death is going to be conquered. I mean, this, this parable is huge because it's talking about history changing God's finally giving us the answer to death. It's all going to change. But there's other truths in here that can be just as powerful to us in our lives right now, in the, in the world we're living in right now. I don't know about you, but people I love live in the vineyard and are acting like the farmers. People I love. And so I need to know that God is going to be graceful to them. I need to know that God is going to keep trying with them. He's going to endlessly keep trying. I need to know that, that God's graciousness is so great and that he's going to continue to bless them in the vineyard even when they're not being obedient to God, when they're choosing to live a different life. I need to know that because there's people out there I love who are not being obedient to God. And that's so comforting to me. You know, he was patient with me. He kept whispering to me. He kept pushing me. And I was living a very self-centered life. And it was all about me and my wants and needs and dreams and desire. And he waited for me and kept giving me opportunities until one day it clicked. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm grateful for that for all the people I love. There's a part of thing that we haven't addressed in this scripture passage. There's this conversation. Jesus references the cornerstone. And if you don't know what a cornerstone is, I want to explain this a little bit because this is very powerful too. If you want to, a cornerstone is, in relation to, to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure with all the other stones laid in reference. If you're going to build something, you start with the cornerstone. The success of the building is going to be the cornerstone and where it's laid. 
Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is, is really referencing a, a, a scripture in Psalms. It's um, Psalms 118 that says, the stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is talking about the rejection of Jesus. It's coming. It's coming fast. It's going to come in less than a week. And then he says something very strange in verse 44. And this is it's very hard to understand. And it, it says, whoever falls on this stone will be crushed. And the stone will crush the person who falls on it. And that's very hard to understand. There's a lot of debate about what that means. But it basically comes from three different scriptures that it's connected to in the Old Testament. And one theologian explains it this way. And this, this, this feels right to me about this message today. It says, Jesus is the foundation stone, which I understand, on which everything is built, and the cornerstone which holds everything together. It all begins in him. To refuse his way is to batter one's head against the walls of the law of God. Fighting God will never make you a winner. We can be believers and still fight God. I mean, that's just a reality. Something happens in our lives and we're like, no, not that. Anything but that, God. Not going to go there, God. Not going to have that, God. Or maybe we're fighting him about circumstances we can't tr control, like wayward children or finances or a loss of a job. I can, there's so many different things. Maybe it's you're having to face taking treatments and you're like, no way. You're fighting God. You're hitting your head against the wall and you're like, no, 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 no. Remember we said about perspective? It's all perspective. Bob Lotick says this, and I think this is so perfect. It's what I need to hear in my life. Good circumstances are only an illusion of security. When things look good, it's easy to understand how things will all work out. Yep, we can all be positive when everything's going well. But isn't it amazing how quick... We can run back to God when, with faith when things look bad. We quickly realize how insecure good circumstances really are. The great news is this for believers. Bad circumstances are only an illusion of a lack of security. We have a promise of a God that will never leave us or forsake us. It doesn't matter how bad things look. It's merely an illusion. Don't be deceived. When your trust is in God, you could not be more secure. Will you pray with me? Father God, forgive us when we're scared. Forgive us when we don't trust. Forgive us when we forget you're the cornerstone, that it all begins and ends with you, that you're never leaving us that you are endlessly loving to us. And for whatever we are hitting our head against the wall about, whatever we are fighting, whatever we're scared about, whatever we are not trusting you, help us to remember because of you, there is always security. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious names. Amen. Oh, sorry. We want to give you an opportunity to uh, respond uh, in faithfulness to God and his great mercy and grace to us by giving your offerings for the ministries of this church. And today I just want to tell you uh, what great ministries we have here at St. Andrews, uh, what you're investing your money into, because I think you're investing your money into a great, uh, a great organization, a great ministry here. And I'm going to tell you about two events that happened just last week. One of them was yesterday. We had 70 plus people gather uh, here yesterday morning, and uh, you see a lot of people with sore muscle today, like I haven't dug holes for shrubbery in years. So uh, basically we planted over 300 uh, plants, uh, shrubs, uh, we, we spruced up the place, we had a wonderful lunch prepared for us, uh, and the whole idea was to get to this campus ready for all the people for Easter.
But you know what's amazing is that, it, if I hope you go outside, you look at all that, how it looks, how nice it looks now. We didn't spend a penny on this. People donated money, people donated their time. This is how a great church that we have is using, uh, being good stewards of the money that's been given to us, like through you. So uh, we had just a, a, a great bonding experience to have everyone come together to work on this cause. Second of all, I want to tell you, last Monday, we had about 100 people uh, from this church go all the way up to Carrollwood area in the midst of rush hour traffic uh, to go to an event called Nehemiah Event, Nehemiah Action, to where we gathered with other churches, filled up a whole sanctuary to let people, to let politicians, to let community leaders know we care about issues of mercy and justice. And we talked to them about issues of criminal justice systems, runoff and flooding concerns, and access to mental health resources uh, to let them know we care about these. And they, they heard from us. So these are just two ministries that are, that are going on that, that uh, benefit from your giving. So during this next song, we'd ask you to, you can see the four ways to give up on the screen and up on, the, uh, you know, on your live stream. You can give online, you can give through mail. Or if you're here in a sanctuary, there's baskets up front and the baskets in the back. So during the next song, we ask you to, to pray about what you might want to give to the church. And also the prayer rail will be open for anybody here in the sanctuary who'd like to come during the prayer time. Thank you.
hearts will cry, these bones they will sing. what it's all about, right, is through everything that we go through on earth, we know that God is beside us and that we can say, great are you, Lord, regardless of what the circumstances are that we see around us, and that our job is to be faithful to him. Why don't you stand up and join me as we sing this last song?
We have a few announcements before we leave today. Well, first of all, next Sunday starts Holy Week. Next Sunday is actually Palm Sunday. And we're going to do something different there this year with the Easter egg hunt. Usually we have the Easter egg hunt on a Saturday. But this year we're going to have it on Sunday, on Palm Sunday. There'll be an egg hunt after this service and one at the 1115 service. And fortunately, we've had such a great response. The Easter egg hunt after this service is full. So, but you can still sign up your kids for the one after 1115 service. But what also mean we need a lot of help with volunteers. So just, you can go up to saumc.life to help up, to help sign up. And we, we decided to do it this time because this Easter egg kind of uh, attracts people from all the community. So if we get them here on Sunday morning, on Palm Sunday, we can invite them to our worship service too. So we, we need a, we'll need a lot of volunteers to make this work. Volunteers to stuff treats and bags beforehand to set up and tear down for registration and check-in for greeters uh, and for to assist at the craft table and also the big one to hide the eggs. So if you go to smuc.life and sign up for one of those opportunities and let's welcome the people who will be coming from the community next Sunday. And then of course that kicks off Holy Week. So Palm Sunday now begins the Holy Week journey. And you're going to be in church a lot that week, so get yourself ready, because on Wednesday night, we're going to have our community dinner. It's our Holy Week dinner, and we've been getting about 100 people to that meal. It's gotten very popular. We're really pleased, and I think it's because we have outstanding food. Um, we'll have yoga church that night. There will be all kinds of Bible studies, and Spark will be in person that night. So that's on Wednesday night. On Thursday night, we will be having a Monday, Thursday service at 7 p.m., and that's a night where we worship. We have just, it's worship and communion. And this is part of preparing your hearts for Easter because if you don't go through the week as Jesus says, Easter never means quite as much. And so we start preparing our hearts knowing what Good Friday service is. And then on Friday, we'll be having the Timberay service, which is a service of darkness. It begins also at 7 p.m. And we begin, and it's, it's, it's a powerful service. And it finally, by the time we get to the end of it, this place is totally dark. And we understand the mourning of what Jesus did for us. We really grieve what he did for us. And then that prepares us, of course, for Easter morning, where we'll have four opportunities to worship. The normal three services plus a 6.30 a.m. sunrise service as well. So we have a lot coming. Holy Week is supposed to be the most important week for us Christians. So plan ahead, plan to be in church a lot that week, and really get ready for Easter morning, which is our celebration. Also, um, we have the um, youth when you go out. Remember last week we were, we were taking donations for our youth. When you leave today, same thing. This is the last week on that. We ask that you go out, pick an envelope, and that you will support them as they go to a mission trip this summer. We're trying to help pay for their mission trips so all the kids can go. So that is following this service immediately. And then lastly, when you go out, you're going to be handed a plastic bag and this is just to remind you about our food pantry. Certain times of the year, the food pantry gets a little low. We're at one of those low times right now. So when you get the plastic bag, there'll be a little card that's um, stapled to it. Take that and go to the grocery store. And this is how I do it. I look for BOGOs. I find BOGOs and then I give everything, the other half, two people add from a food pantry. It will not cost you anything extra. You can do BOGOs through all of it and you really will bless the food pantry who needs it now? Okay, that's enough announcements. So let's stand up for the benediction. May the peace of God reign in this place and the love of God forever hold you tight. May the spirit of God flow through your life and the joy of God uphold you day and night. Amen. Go in peace. Have a good day. Sons and daughters crying out. Ooh.